I'm Donald Davis. Thank you for joining us for the 20th annual Sounds of the Mountain Story Festival. The first stories I ever told were not my original stories. No, they were my version of retelling family stories I heard from people like my Uncle Frank, my grandmother, and lots of stories from my dad. Sometimes today I'm working so much on new stories that I forget to go way back and keep some of those oldest stories alive. And what I want to do now is tell you a story that my little brother and I used to love to hear our daddy tell when we were little kids growing up. My dad was one of 13 children. He was number seven. And right in the middle of those 13 children, there were four boys close together in a row. It was Uncle Moody, Uncle Harry, my daddy, and Uncle Frank. They were all born between 1898 and 1903. And they were so close their whole lives. Well, this story happened maybe about 1910 when they were, say, about 8 to 12 years old. And it was in the late summer when they were helping their daddy, my granddaddy, do what they always called making hay. They had this beautiful pair of big, blonde, Belgian workhorses. They would hook those horses up to the mowing machine, and then they would mow the hay, mow the hay, mow the hay. When the hay was all cut, they would hook the horses up to the, to the, to the hay rake, and then they would rake the hay up into little windrows. And after it dried a little bit, they would go back, and they would rake those windrows up into little piles, maybe about three or four feet around, maybe about two or three feet high, and then you could swing a chain around that pile, stand on the top of it, hook the chain on the back of the horse, and you could ride that little pile of hay right back up to the barn to where the big haystack was going to be. And then the real work started. Everybody had to get their pitchfork and start building the haystacks around two big poles at the end of the barn. Finally, finally, they would come out with a dome-shaped haystack that was maybe about two stories tall. And they were perfectly shaped so they would turn the water when it rained and the cows could eat off of them round and round all through the wintertime. Well, by the end of one of those days working in the hay, they would have hay everywhere. Hay up their nose, hay in their hair, hay in their ears, hay in their mouth, hay down inside their clothes, and they would be itching, itching, itching all over. Now, what would you want to do at a time like that? Take a bath, right? Well, there was no bathroom, no way to take a bath. So what they would do is, they would walk about a mile to the Pigeon River. And then when they got to the river, they'd take their clothes off, shake, 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 beat, beat, beat all the hay off of their clothes. And then they'd jump in the river naked and they'd swim all around and they'd scrub with the sand that was accumulated along the edges of the river. And they'd scrub till they got all the itch off. And then they'd come out and run around till they got dry. And then they'd shake their clothes some more and put them back on. And then when they got home, they didn't itch to death all night. One day they'd been working in the hay, and they got ready to leave and go to the river, when all of a sudden Uncle Frank stopped everybody. Now, Uncle Frank was the youngest of those brothers, but my daddy also said that he had a very special job in that family. He was in charge of bad ideas. Yep. Uncle Frank said, it is too far to run a mile to jump in the river. What we need is a swimming hole here at home. They said, the river's not here. We can't have a swimming hole at home. He said, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. This is something I read about in a book. Rich people have it. Behind the house, they have a big old hole in the ground, and it's all full of water, and anytime you want to, you can go out and jump in it. Let's dig one. My daddy said, Frank, that sounds dangerous. I don't believe mom and daddy let us do that. And Uncle Frank says, I know. That's why we're not going to tell them. Well, my daddy told the brothers that he would watch them get in trouble, but he would not help. They went to the barn. They gathered up all the tools you could dig with. 
They got the spade. They got a couple of shovels. They got a pickaxe. They got the old mattock out there. And, and they came back out looking for the place they were going to hide and dig the swimming hole. Right outside the kitchen door, and I remember playing on this rock when I was a little boy, there was a huge rock. It was round on top. It was almost as high as the house, huge. And you could go on the back side of that rock, and nobody in the house could see you. So they went behind that rock, and they marked out a square on the ground. That's where the swimming hole was going to be, and they got to work. Now, it was late in the summer, and it had not rained for almost two months. And that old clay ground was so hard, you could not get a shovel to go into it. But they got an idea. Since they had that mattock, they decided that one of them could take the mattock and chop and chop in the ground, chop in the ground, chop in the ground, till you got some dirt broken loose. <clears throat> and then another one could take the shovel and shovel it out. And then somebody would chop again, and then shovel it out, and then chop some more, and then shovel it out. And if you just kept on doing that, in about a hundred years, you'd have a swimming hole. Well, they were working away. Uncle Harry was chopping with the mattock. Uncle Frank was shoveling the dirt out. Now, <clears throat> besides being in charge of bad ideas, my daddy always said that Uncle Frank was different in another way. My daddy said Uncle Frank was born with a slight birth defect. He was born without a lid to go on his mouth. And when he was talking, it used his entire mentality. You see, he'd wake up talking in the morning. He'd talk all day long. He'd have to put every bite back in his mouth two or three times because he'd talk and the food would blow out. He'd talk at night till it was time to go to sleep. He'd stop talking just long enough to sleep, and then he'd talk and he'd sleep all night. And as my daddy said, when he was talking, he wasn't thinking. Are you getting the picture? See, Uncle Harry's chopping with the mattock. Uncle Frank is shoveling and talking. And one of those times... Uncle Harry came back with the mattock. At the same moment, Uncle Frank leaned down with the shovel. And the mattock came down and chopped him right in the crown of the head. And the blood squirted out everywhere. He started screaming, I'm killed, I'm killed, I'm killed. And his brother said, you're not killed. You couldn't holler like that if you were killed. Well, they all started running toward the house. Imagine my poor grandmother. She's just in there washing the dishes. All of a sudden, she heard a great big racket. She ran to the back door and opened the screen door. Here comes one of her sons with blood squirting out of his head, squalling, I'm killed, I'm killed, right behind him. Here comes another one with a shovel, and then here comes another one with the mattock. Well, Uncle Frank went running in the house. My grandmother washed out the dish rag with cold water, and she held it on his head, and she washed it in cold water, and she held it on his head, and she kept on, finally, finally, she got it to stop bleeding. And then she looked at his head, and she said, so that's what the bone looks like. He was cut to the bone. Now, you know what the real problem was at this moment? They lived 16 miles from town on an old dirt road. Nobody had a vehicle of any kind. I'm not sure a vehicle ever, ever even been all the way out there to that farm. And even if they had some way to get to town, they didn't even know a doctor or if there was a doctor around there. So as usual, my grandmother knew she was going to have to take care of the trouble. Well, she got out her straight razor. You see, she shaved my granddaddy with the straight razor. It was her straight razor. She stropped it all up. And she shaved all the hair off around where Frank's head was cut open. Got it all clean and open. And then she dropped something in the boiling water on the stove. And let it boil for a few minutes. And after that, she fished out of the water what she dropped in there, which was a big old needle with thread on it. And right quick, she got the other three boys to hold Frank down so he couldn't run off. And while they held him down in the kitchen floor, she got down there and she sewed up his head. 
Well, when she got it all sewn up, she said to my granddaddy, she said, you know, I've never done this before. I don't know if I did it right or not. <clears throat> you better get him into town and, and get a doctor to look at it because it might have to be done over again. I sewed everything back on in. Maybe some of it's supposed to hang out. I don't know. Well, so my granddaddy got Uncle Frank up on one of those workhorses. They were bareback. They didn't have a saddle for a workhorse. It was a big old, big old horse. And, and they rode into town like that. They got all the way into town way after dark. Now, their oldest brother, Uncle Grover, he was 16 years older than my dad. He had passed the bar, and he was a lawyer in town. So they went to Brother Grover's house, spent the night, and the next morning, Uncle Grover took them to the doctor's house. Well, the doctor examined Uncle Frank's head. Looked at it and looked at it. Checked it all out. And then he asked my granddaddy three questions. Did this boy's mama sew his head up like this? Yes. Did she boil the needle and thread first? Don't know how she knew to do that. The last question. Does she make quilts? My granddaddy said, well, yes. Well, how come? The doctor said, well, as closely as I can figure, I would have given him about five or six stitches. I believe she put in 30. Little teeny stitches like when she was quilted, just perfect little stitches. The doctor said she did such a perfect job, it might not even leave a scar when it heals up. Well, after that, they got out a big brown glass jug, iodine, and they painted iodine on that cut open place, and Uncle Frank started squalling again. I'm killed, I'm killed, because it was just about to burn him up. Finally, they headed back home. And when they got all the way back home, finally, Uncle Frank got to look in the mirror. He got tickled at himself. There, a great big swarp of his hair was shaved off. There, he had been sewed up, like by his mama. And now he had a, a reddish-brown stripe painted on top of it. He thought, I am so funny looking. They will never make me go to church looking like this. But guess what? They did. And my dad said there hadn't been that much laughter at the Methodist church for 25 years. Well, when it was all over, my granddaddy gathered those boys up together, gathered them all up. He said, now, boys, boys, let's talk about this. I guess now you know you did something wrong. And there ought to be some punishment. But you know what I always say? If you learn something, that's better than getting punished. So, boys, I'll make a deal with you. If each one of you can tell me a different thing that each of you learned, there won't be any punishment. How about that? He said, Moody, you're the oldest, so you go first. Did you learn anything? Uncle Moody thought about it. Finally, he said, uh, I did. We don't need a swimming hole. My dad said, that's good. That's good. He said, uh, Harry, did you learn anything? Uncle Harry thought a little bit. He said, yes, sir. If you ever have to get a whole lot of blood out of somebody, hit them right whack in the top of the head. He said, well, I guess that's right. Harry, I guess that's right. I guess that'll do. And he said to Uncle Frank, he said, Frank, did you learn anything? I hope you did. Uncle Frank says, I did. I don't even have to think about it. If two people are working... And one of them's got a shovel, and one of them's got a mattock. You better be the one that's got the mattock. And my granddad laughed and said, that's good, Frank. That'll be fine. And then he said to my daddy, little Joe, did you learn anything? My dad said, I didn't have to. Because you see, since it was Frank's idea, I already knew it was a bad idea. But here's what I discovered today. If I ever grow up and have children, I'm going to tell my children that their Uncle Frank 
is the best teacher they'll ever have. What they need to do is ask him questions and look at what he does. Ask him questions and watch what he does. Ask him questions, pay attention to what he does, and then don't do any of it. And that was the end of that story for that day. But let me tell you the end of it for this day. Our son Kelly and his wife Erin have a little boy. Their son is six years old. And his name is Frank. Because in Kelly's childhood memory, his great uncle Frank, my uncle Frank, was his favorite childhood relative. But you know what's weird about that? In reality, Uncle Frank died five years before Kelly was born. But you can't convince Kelly of that. Because you see, when he was growing up, he heard so many stories about Uncle Frank that he is absolutely convinced that he remembers him. And that's what our stories can do. They can keep alive people we love who are already long gone from this world. The Sounds of the Mountain Story Festival is an important annual fundraiser for Camp Bethel in Fincastle, Virginia. I hope you'll please think about giving a donation to the at the link below. Thank you for watching and thank you for your gift to Camp Bethel. We hope the festival will be back home in person next year and need your help in getting the camp ready to reopen as soon as possible for summer camps, guest groups, and special events like the festival. Please click on the link below and make your contribution toward the work, the fun, and the fellowship that find a home at Camp Bethel. Thanks for watching and thank you for your gift.